myself. <laughs> so I, I have to watch this later and see what I should have said better. I'm Todd Marquardt. I'm an attorney here in San Antonio. I have my own law firm called Marquardt Law Firm. We have uh, three attorneys and 10 support staff there, and we focus on business and estate law, including last wills, living trusts, and tax-protected inheritance plans. Today's topic is the transfer on death deed, the pros and cons of it. But before we get to answering that question, I have to give you some background. And then I'll talk about the statute, and then I'll talk about whether you, could, you should reconsider your decision to do a transfer on death deed. First, I want to tell you about a man named Morris. Morris tragically died shortly after his 70th birthday. He was a young man. And just imagine what it would be like for his wife and his son and daughter to be sitting at the conference table at the lawyer's office for the reading of the will. The will starts, I, Morris Smith, being of sound mind, make the following gifts. To my beautiful wife, Rebecca, I leave my half of the homestead plus the apartment in Manhattan. I'm sorry if you didn't know about the apartment. <laughs> it's yours now. Enjoy it, darling. To my handsome, hardworking son, Paul, I leave the hunting ranch where we spent so many seasons hunting everything from wild hogs to white-tailed deer. Keep up the good work, Paul. To my gorgeous and clever daughter, clever daughter, Suzanne, I leave the beach house. She always did make good grades in school and got her master's degree. Proud of you, darling. And to my brother, Henry, who always said in no uncertain terms that health was so much more important than wealth, I leave my exercise bike and my treadmill. <laughs> So this is just an example of why we would leave anything to anyone. And so you're probably thinking the same thing. Now, transfer on death deed, that applies to real estate. And so that's what we're going to focus on today is the real estate. But before we start talking about transfer on death deed, I do need to give you some background because this is a relatively new thing uh, that the state legislature uh, enacted in 2015. So uh, before the transfer on death deed was invented, we had the gift deed, where you just give your property to who you want while you're alive can't sign this after you're gone, so this is a lifetime gift. Then we had the uh, life estate deed. And there's no real statute for that either, but attorneys have been using it a really, really long time. And basically what it says is, I give you the property, but I reserve the right to live there for the rest of my life. So it's a lifetime gift that takes effect after death. And then we liked this so well, we, we invented another one called a ladybird deed. And then, of course, we'll talk about transfer on death deed. I didn't make it up. <laughs> it, it just so happens that each letter of transfer on death deed spells my name. So 
who knows what the problems are with each one of these things? Okay, good. I'm here for a reason. I'll enlighten you. Okay, the gift deed is effective during life. And so there's a tax problem with the gift deed. How many of you know of taxes on gifts? A couple of you, you've heard of that. Well, when you give somebody something worth more than $15,000 in a year, the IRS wants you to file a 709 gift tax return. Now, you may not have to pay any tax because there's a gift tax exclusion amount, a lifetime of gifts that you can give before you have to pay a tax. But still, you have this uh, obligation to submit a return. The bigger problem is the tax that your beneficiary uh, might have to pay because when you give somebody something during your life, the gift receiver has to carry over your cost basis. Now, you didn't know you signed up for a tax course, but there are some tax concepts that we should discuss. When you buy a property, the price that you pay is your cost basis. And that's the measuring amount that the IRS uses to decide how much capital gains tax you're going to pay after you sell it. So if you bought a property in year 2000 for $100,000 and you wanted to sell it in 2020 for $150,000, the appreciation and gain there, the 50000 that's what you would pay capital gains tax. And so if, if you, instead of selling it in 2020, you give it to your son, daughter, or granddaughter, or nephew, and then they want to sell it the very next day, they have to pay that same tax. So that's an issue that we bring up whenever somebody wants to give away their property while they're still alive. That's different with the life estate deed. Remember I said the life estate deed is a transaction that occurs during your life, but it's not effective until after death. Well, in the IRS regulations, it says that if somebody inherits an appreciated asset after death, then they get adjusted basis instead of carryover basis. And so most of the time, property values go up, and so we would call that a step up in basis. So let's say... Um, you sign your life estate deed in year 2000 and you pass away in year 2020. Your beneficiary decides to sell the property the very next day. Well, their new adjusted basis would be the fair market value as of the time of death. And so there, there's no appreciation there between fair market value and, and uh, adjusted basis value. And so they, they pay no capital gains tax in that scenario. Is everybody following? Some of you? Just know that there's a, a tax issue there. Now, what is the problem with the life estate deed? I'll tell you. It's irrevocable. So let's say 22 years ago, you signed a life estate deed. You name your granddaughter to be beneficiary. But in year 2020 or in year 2018, before you die, uh, she gets addicted to drugs. And you say, well, I don't want her to have my property anymore. She's just going to sell it and use it for drugs. Well, you can't change that. 
So that's, that's a disadvantage for that one. Now with the ladybird deed, there are some enhancements. So some attorneys call that an enhanced life estate deed. So why do some people call it ladybird? That's silly, right? You're probably thinking of Lady Bird Johnson, yes. But according to Professor Jerry Beyer, who taught at St. Mary's here in San Antonio, now he's a professor at Texas Tech in Lubbock, he says that the myth going around that President Lyndon Johnson used this type of deed to transfer property to his wife, Lady Bird Johnson, is not true. It's a myth. Instead, this type of deed was named because an attorney in Florida named uh, Jerome <coughs> Solkoff in 1982 was describing all the characteristics of this new type of deed in his book and lecture materials, another professor. Professors like to make up names of fictional characters when describing how a scenario might play out. So his characters and his example were Linton, Lady Bird, Lucy, and Linda. This is what law professors do. And so the use of the Lady Bird, that stuck because it's something that people can remember. And uh, in Texas, we borrow some things from Florida and Florida borrows some things from Texas. We're both community property states. So we share that in common. So the enhancement in the Lady Bird deed was that the grantor could retain the power to sell the property and keep the money for himself or herself. So then the grantee, the gift receiver, doesn't have much to expect if it can be sold out from underneath them without their consent. The reason why attorneys like that concept is because it wasn't a disqualifying type of deed when people were applying for nursing home Medicaid. Medicaid has this rule that if you give away your assets in order to qualify for the benefit, then you could suffer some penalty. Well, because the grantee, the beneficiary, doesn't have much, much to expect because it could be sold out from underneath them, Medicaid said that that type of transfer had no value to the beneficiary. And so it, because it had no value to the beneficiary, they said, we're not going to penalize you for doing that. So we used the Lady Bird deed successfully for decades. And then in 2015, yes, ma'am. Just what, what does it do to the person giving it away as far as Medicaid is concerned? It's not a disqualifying transfer for the person that's giving it away. Right. No right. Is that for both Medicare and Medicaid? Well, in Medicare, the health insurance that you get when you turn 65 it's not a means-tested program, and so Medicare doesn't really, uh, isn't concerned about anything that you do with your assets. It's only Medicaid because it is a means-tested program. But let me get through this because we got a lot more to cover with transfer on death deed. Um, government benefits is uh, another topic with lots of other rules and so uh, tell the folks here at Oasis that you're interested in that, and I'll come back. So in 2015, the legislators said, uh, we need to put this in the statutes, in the property code, um, because title companies, real estate title companies, would treat the Lady Bird deed unfairly. <laughs> because Title companies are really insurance companies. They're insuring the title, and they don't want anybody to sue them. 
And so they would do things like require that the beneficiary of the deed has to agree to the sale. Well, that doesn't make any sense because they don't have any expectation in even owning the property. They're not really a party to the transaction if it's sold. But anyway, that's why the legislature got involved here. Okay, so now I'm going to go through the statutes of how the, the, the transfer on death deed works. And, and we can kind of compare and cr contrast that with the life estate deed and the ladybird deed. So in section um, 114051, it says transfer on death deed is authorized by the legislature. It's authorized by the legislature. So what was the section? Oh, 114051. 114052 says that the transfer on death deed is revocable. So it works kind of like the Lady Bird deed in that the property could still be sold. We don't have to include the power of sale language in the transfer on death deed because it's in the statute. So if you have a granddaughter that gets addicted to drugs, you can change your mind. You just have to file another transfer on death deed or sell the property or, or whatever. Section 114053 says that it's non-testamentary. What testamentary means upon death, non-testamentary means during life. And the only remarkable thing about that is just like I said, you sign it while you're alive, becomes effective later. You still get to enjoy the property while you're alive. Now I say a lot of times, you get to live there for the rest of your life, but it doesn't have to be your residence. It doesn't have to be your homestead. You could do a transfer on death deed with uh, your vacation property, your rental property, with your uh, ranch or, or whatever. Section 114054 says that the capacity required to make or revoke a transfer on death deed is the same as the capacity required to make a contract. Capacity is almost the same as competency. So if you develop Alzheimer's or dementia, can't sign, a transfer on death deed unless you understand it the same way as you would a contract. Understand what your rights and obligations are and so forth. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so it could be contested just like a will. If somebody said, well, Martha didn't have the capacity to sign a transfer on death deed she probably didn't know what she was signing. She had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. The requirements for a transfer on death deed to be effective are that, well, it has to satisfy all the requirements of a valid deed. It has to have uh, the grantor, the address of the grantor, the name of the grantee, the address of the grantee, has to have a des description of the property sufficient so that the property can be identified, has to be in writing, doesn't have to be recorded unless it's a transfer on death deed. This is a new requirement. In the old days, before 2015, <laughs> A gift deed, a life estate deed, a ladybird deed, a general warranty deed, a special warranty deed, they were all effective even if they weren't recorded. Now you would record a deed to prevent 
the grantor from selling the same property twice, which is fraud. Recording it lets everybody know that a transaction has been made. So that's, that's what the title company's for. They search the deed records. They see who was, who was the last owner. So each deed that has ever been made on a property constitutes a link in the chain of title, all the way back to Davy Crockett. So it has to be a valid deed, and then it has to be recorded before death. So this is a new requirement. And there are court cases about, well, it didn't get recorded, and so the judge just says, statute says it has to be recorded. Now, you don't even have to, the next one, 114056, says that you don't even have to tell your beneficiary that they, they're getting it. So it's kind of like your will. You can keep your will private until after you pass away. Same thing with the transfer on death deed. You don't have to tell your beneficiary that they're going to receive the property. And of course, your beneficiary doesn't have to pay anything. Typically, general warranty deed, special warranty deed, there has to be consideration, payment made in exchange for the property in order for the transaction to be valid. But for gifts, there's no consideration except for love and affection for. So for gift deed, life estate deed, ladybird deed, transfer on death deed, nobody has to pay anything. Sometimes it is possible for somebody to buy a life estate or to buy the remainder interest. But that's getting into the weeds. You don't need to know much about that today. We're just talking about making a gift that's effective upon death. Okay, now this one's going to blow your mind. Section 114057. How many think they know what's coming? Taxes. No, not taxes, but how does your will affect the transfer on death deed? Anybody been thinking that? Yes. Yeah. So the transfer on death deed is sort of like the pay on death beneficiary of a bank account. All, both bypass your will. And sometimes that causes problems. So I would recommend that you always know what your beneficiary designations are because I have a lot of people from the next generation that complain about it when it's not consistent. Now you can be inconsistent on purpose if you want to, but it leaves them thinking that there was a mistake. Say, John was on the pay on death for the bank account at Bank of America, but John and his brother Jeff are beneficiaries of the house and the will. And so Jeff is thinking, why does John get the bank account when the both of us are supposed to share? And John says, hey, that's what mom wanted. <laughs> that's the way she did it. But it leaves Jeff wondering if John did something underhanded. So I forgot to tell you about some of my philosophies at the law office. After doing this for 16 years, I've come up with the idea that it's my job to help reduce family conflict. Because I value the family. I value my family, and I see what happens when other families get broken up and upset with each other and fight and estranged. And so I try and prevent that if I can. 
But like I said, you can do that if you want to. You have your own reasons. And so what I might suggest is just be consistent in the will so that it says John's getting the bank account, John and Jeff get the property. Then Jeff knows at least mom was consistent with the will and the pay on death. Yes, ma'am. Necessary is a strong word. <laughs> yeah, th this is a preference. So we'll go through at the end um, some scenarios where it might be a good idea for you to use a transfer on death deed and other scenarios where it might not. But I, I like that you're tracking my, my line of thinking here. So transfer on death deed is like a pay on death in that it bypasses the will. So even if the will had something contrary, if, if the pay on death said John gets the bank account and the will said Jeff gets the bank account, well, the pay on death beneficiary still trumps the will because it op the pay on death operates by the terms of the account agreement. And so immediately upon death, it's no longer an asset of the deceased person. Whereas if it's an asset of the estate, then it's subject to the terms of the will. Now there are some times when uh, a contest could claw that back into the estate or where a creditor might claw that account back into the estate to try and satisfy the claims of the creditors. More on that later, but I just wanted you to know that the statute says that the will doesn't affect the transfer on death deed. The transfer on death deed is going to operate on its own and so that's one of the advantages is that it'll bypass the probate process. A will has to go through probate in order to be effective. Banks, financial institutions, real estate title companies will not honor the will unless a judge says that it's a valid will. The transfer on death deed is going to be followed unless it's wrong uh, which sort of did happen to me one time. I had to clear up title for somebody. Her father had tried to consolidate assets from when his parents passed away. And so he was buying his sibling's interest in, in property. And what he used in order to make known that that transaction happened is he created this document that said deed at the top and then it said um, my sister gives me power of attorney to do real estate transactions concerning this property and so the title company said well this is neither a deed nor a power of attorney it's just junk that got recorded and so you're going to have to do everything from scratch in order to transfer title in order to get this thing cleared up and sold. So that stuff does happen. If He must have created that on his own. So I don't recommend doing that. Ends up being like Frankenstein's monster, which was a disaster, right? So anyway, Transfer on death deed operates outside of the probate system. Now the only thing that could happen to render the transfer on death deed ineffective is if you got divorced after you signed the transfer on death deed and you were trying to convey property to your spouse. So there's a similar statute that affects wills if you name your spouse in your will and then get divorced, well, it's just 
treat it as if your spouse predeceased you, which is probably what you wanted to begin with. <laughs> okay. Now the next section, right on time, 114.101, is what effect does signing this transfer on death deed have on my homestead exemption, on my veteran's exemption, if you have that? on my over 65 property exemption. Well, the statute says that those exemptions are not affected. So that's a good thing. You, your taxes won't go up. Now, some of those are only related to your homestead. Some of them are not. Okay, Miss, in the back, you had a question and I I got excited and kept talking. Yes, I heard uh, that if everything you have is less than a certain amount of money, you don't have to probate. That's a great question. She said that if all of your assets are below a certain amount of money, in Texas it's 75000 then you don't have to go through probate. But that's there is some truth and some of it's not true. Some of it's accurate, some of it's not accurate. What, what the statute for small estate affidavit says is that if you have no will and your assets are less than $75,000 and your debts don't exceed your assets, then you can file a small estate affidavit with the probate court. <laughs> now, some people think that this is easier, but it's not. And I'll tell you why. When you have a will, you have one person usually named the executor that files everything with the probate. The one person dealing with the attorney it's easy to deal with one person. I'll emphasize that again. With the small estate affidavit, you have the, the person that's interested in clearing up title. There's no executor, so this could be a spouse or son or daughter, granddaughter, nephew. And then you have to find two disinterested witnesses to sign that will swear under oath that the person was never divorced, or if they were, you know, what the divorces were, what the remarriages were, who all the children were, and that the debts don't exceed the assets, and that the assets are under $75,000. Well, in my experience, you try and find two people that knew everything about this person's family relationships, but knew nothing about the finances. I mean, could you find two people that know how much money you have that aren't interested in your estate, that aren't family members? So there's this, this that's the difficulty, is finding two people that know you well enough to know your family and that are, not dis, that are not interested in receiving the benefits. And that just also happen to know how much money you had and that you didn't have many debts. So that, that's really the challenge. Um, I would only, I would never recommend that somebody do that on purpose. Usually it's just because somebody died before they got around to writing their will. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. Okay, the next section, 114.102, says that if the grantor, the person that signed the transfer on death deed already, decides to do a gift deed or decides to sell the property, that those things do supersede the transfer on death deed. Because it, it works kind of like the ladybird deed in that 
the beneficiary doesn't have anything that they can hold on to. They, prob they probably don't even know that they're on there. So it's revocable, remember? And so that, those are a couple of the ways that it could be revoked. Well, we already learned about one way um, previously was just to sign another transfer on death deed, naming a different beneficiary. But if you give away the property while you're still alive, that also operates to revoke the transfer on death deed because the property no longer is, is the grantor's property to give upon death. And there are more court cases about that. So if you have competing family members trying to get mom and dad's property, this is sometimes what will happen is um, son will convince mom or dad to do the transfer on death deed and then they go back to California and, and forget about it. And then the daughter convinces mom or dad, hey, why don't you let me have the property while you're alive and I'll live there with you and take care of you. Well, maybe mom and dad forgot about the transaction as well. And you, you don't have to have Alzheimer's or dementia to forget, right? I have lots of clients that years after we do something, a will or a trust, they'll come back and I'll ask, you know, what have you been up to? And they say, oh, I forgot all about that. It's just the nature of taking care of our lives. You know, we forget things. We get busy going to Oasis, <laughs> right? going on the trips to the Grand Canyon. Any questions on how to revoke or otherwise supersede the transfer on death deed? I just have a question. I don't think. Oh. Do the two people who are married own a home that's their homestead? Is this transfer on death deed required to ensure that when one or the other dies, the home goes stays with the other spouse. That's and a that, great question. And that the children or the deceased spouse don't have a claim because I attended something once, and the woman said, "Who was an attorney?" So you own a home together. You think that when you die, the home goes to your spouse. Mm -hmm. or to your co-owner, co yeah. whatever that might be. But in Texas, that's not the way it works. She right. said that the deceased family members would have a claim to the house. Now, how does that work? Possibly. How does that work? So the question is, do I have to do one of these in order to get the property to my spouse to prevent the stepchildren from making a claim? Well, and, and the answer is required is a strong word. So there's lots of ways there's lots of ways to accomplish that, but the concept is the same. In Texas, because of community property, the law presumes that each spouse owns one half. And you can give your one half to whoever you want. You don't have to give it to your spouse. You just can't give more than your one half. So I always tell my spouse that, that same thing. Look, when I pass away, you get half, and I'll give my half to whoever I want to. <laughs> no, most, most spouses want to take care of their spouse. And so you should do something to make that effective. Now, you can do that with a will, or you can do it with a life estate deed, or a ladybird deed, or a transfer on death deed. You can also do it with a uh, community property agreement. So there's something in the family code that, that points to that. Um, there's also something else called joint tenants with rights of survivorship. 
And so that's, that's a way for the survivor to uh, become owner of the property by, by operation of the deed. What's that other one, joint? joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Again, it's a concept borrowed from what you can do at the bank when you have a joint account with your spouse and the survivor just gets to keep it. But not everything is, is set up that way. Um, it's just that bankers usually choose that for you, whether you want it or not. That's, that's my experience is that, hey, nobody asked me this question. It's they just assume. So you're saying that if people have a joint account, it just automatically goes to the other one. Is that right? It's possible, but you should ask. Ask for your account agreement and then say, hey, are there two people on my account? Because it could be that somebody just has signature authority to write checks and that ends upon death. It could be just plain joint tenants, in which case one half would go to your estate subject to probate. Or it could be this other thing, joint tenants with rights of survivorship, where the survivor gets the account. There, there's lots of possibilities. That's why I think bankers and estate planners should work together. Okay, let's talk about creditors' claims. This is... I think a disadvantage with transfer on death deed because the legislators made this, put this in the, the statute book. And so what they did is they just borrowed the creditor's claims procedure from the probate code and said, if there's claims after death, this property is still going to be subject to those claims. Whereas the ladybird deed and the life estate deed, they're not creatures of statute. And so nothing says that a creditor can go after those properties. But you're thinking, I don't have creditors. Well, then it's, it's not really a problem for you. But you could have uh, creditors because of a last illness. Medical catastrophes are the number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States. So it's within the realm of possibilities. And then you're thinking, well, I don't want to get out of it paying my debts. I'll pay my debts. Well, then it's not a problem for you. See, for me, dealing with creditors is like Tom and Jerry. Remember the cartoon, Tom the cat and Jerry the mouse? Well, dealing with creditors is kind of like that for me. You pay the creditors only if you have to. <laughs> That's why the rest of us pay 18% on our credit cards. Okay, now section 114105 says that the beneficiary can disclaim the benefit. Remember, we said that the beneficiary doesn't even need to be informed. They don't need notice that they've been named. And so for some beneficiaries, they think receiving this property is going to cause me more problems, either because they're on government benefits, or they have tax problems, or they have creditor problems, or they're so wealthy that they're going to be subject to federal estate tax and they don't want any more assets to go to federal estate tax. So that's pretty much it about, well, there's one more thing. 114106 talks again about creditor's claims when the transferor's estate is insufficient to satisfy a claim. 
What is important to remember about this section of the statute is that a proceeding to enforce the liability must be commenced not later than the second anniversary of the transferor's death. So there's a two-year statute of limitations on the creditor's claim. And so we don't have that, again, with Lady Bird deed or life estate deed. There might be other, there are other challenges that are, I'll, I'll talk about. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Yeah, back up to the one previous. Uh, the beneficiary is going to disclaim the benefit. Right. Well, yes, it, it could be subject to the estate, the will then. It's as if there was no, no beneficiary. Okay, yes, in the back. Um, the suicide, uh, is, does that affect anything if the person who owns the property and everything, if they commit suicide, does that affect? That's a great question that I don't think I've ever been asked. <laughs> I have never run into a complication by suicide except for life insurance because usually they have a clause in there about that. Now homicide, yes. There, there's a provision in the con Texas Constitution and there's also Texas case law that says that um, somebody should not be able to benefit from their own wrongdoing. Okay, yes ma'am, in the front. Um, okay, so if you have several children and you have property, is there a deed that you can use where you would specifically say, um, I want this property to be divided into four, three, whatever number, and specifically, um, you get equal share, you know, you're specifying all of this. You get equal share after you pay my debts and whatever is left is yours. Is there a deed that you can use specifically like that? Because she, you're saying you, have bene you want the beneficiary yeah. to be times four. Right. So she's asking, is there a deed that's specific to spelling out how the beneficiaries receive their interest. Any of these deeds you could specify. It, it's just that the attorney has to artfully draft that. Does all it have to do, but let's say you designate one of the four to uh, over, oversee the, the sale of the property, let's say. You can't do that in a deed. She's asking, can you designate one of the beneficiaries in a deed to oversee things? That, that's getting to be a little more complex outside of just the deed. But I like the way you think because that's one of the things that makes it complicated enough that maybe the transfer on death deed isn't for you. So. Right. So if you specify enough, and then whoever argues, you're out. <laughs> right. Yeah. She's she's talking about the uh, no contest clause, like in a will. Okay. So we've gone through all of the transfer on death deed statutes, but that's not the end of our analysis today. Remember, the name of the course is pros and cons. So I told you some of the cons are that it's subject to these creditor claims provisions. That the Lady Bird deed doesn't have. But don't all run out and get a Lady Bird deed because you might remember I mentioned at the very beginning that the reason that there's a statute on this is because real estate title companies weren't comfortable with the Lady Bird deed. So they will say things like, well, all the grantees, all the beneficiaries have to sign. 
when there's no law that says that. Here's a scenario. You sign your ladybird deed while you're healthy and alive. After you pass away, the beneficiaries are um, your, your son that did everything he was supposed to as a productive citizen, pays his taxes, and stays out of jail. And then you have a daughter who's arrested for selling methamphetamines and is currently in prison. Well, if the son wants to sell the property and the daughter's in prison and the title company says she has to sign, well, that's not practical. So th this is a real life scenario where we had to shop all the title companies. Title insurance isn't the same everywhere. Title companies are not all the same. And so sometimes you need an attorney to explain to them that they're wrong and that they need to talk to their legal counsel. So I wouldn't say anything is perfect, but you just have to match up what works best for you for your, the facts and circumstances in your life. So I'm gonna pass out a worksheet, and if you need a pen, tell me, because I have more. And we're gonna do this uh, self-analysis on whether this is a good idea for you. Will you help me pass some of these Absolutely. out? Will you pass these down? Thank you. Just keep passing them around. Anybody need a pen? Now, you don't have to turn this in. It's not homework. Um, but it, it'll help you think through whether this is a good idea for you. You need a pen? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. There's enough, so we'll get you one. Say that again. Somebody told me a long time ago that the life of state deed, you had to wait seven years for it to be effective. That wasn't true? No, what they're probably talking about is um, the Medicaid look back rule. Oh, yeah. So it, it's still effective, it's just that you might be penalized. Okay. Yeah. On the transfer of debt deeds, they don't look back. Right. Okay. It's, it's a, it's doesn't, it doesn't disqualify it doesn't you. Yeah. Do you, are you getting more copies? Do you need more copies? No, she was going to tell me something. Oh, okay. Well, let me pass those yeah. out. Thank you. Anybody else need one? Sure. Thank you for doing that. Okay, so I'm going to go through each one. The transfer on death deed is simple. It'll work for simple situations. And so if you own your home and you just need one transfer on death deed to transfer that home, this might be a good idea. You want to avoid probate just for this one asset. Some people only have one house and they have no other complications. This is very simple for you to carry out. Notice that these, these four questions here, we only focused on you, your situation. So it gets more complicated when you look at the bottom 10 questions because now we're looking at 
Well, who are the other people in your lives? Remember Adam from the Bible? Well, his life only became more complicated when God added another person. <laughs> Remember? He got to name all the animals and all the plants. And, of course, he was probably lonely. But it only became more complicated when God added another person. And so we come up with this idea that we should get married and have kids maybe. And we're just adding more and more people that makes our lives more and more complicated. So if you look at how do I make their situation better, well, sometimes that takes more complexity when we're looking at reducing family conflict, when we're looking at uh, protecting and preserving assets, when we're looking at taxes. So number two, do you want to keep the property in the family? Well, it's not automatically going to stay in the family. I, I do have um, some people that are, have asked me to put in their will that it just goes to son or daughter. I ask them, do you want it to stay in the family? They say, yes, but John and Susie know what I want. And they're always going to keep it in the family. And I tell them, well, you know, John and Susie might have other life circumstances after you pass away that you're not able to consider. So only leave it to John and Susie if it doesn't matter to you whether they leave it in the family or not. Because if you want it to stay in the family, you need a provision in there that says it'll stay in the family. And we can't put that in a transfer on death deed. We put that in a trust. Yes, ma'am. I'm just curious. In Texas, do you, do you have to consider your children or can you let that? She's asking, do we have to leave it to our children? And the answer is no. No, there, there's no requirement that you leave it to anybody. The only statute that you have to be aware of is that you can't give more than what you have. So if you're married, you can't give your spouse's assets away. You can only control the assets that are subject to your control. And you can disinherit people, and you can disinherit your spouse, like I said, but they still get to keep their half. Another question? Yes? She's asking, who, who would a beneficiary be? Well, you can name a charity or a church or a nephew or a grandchildren, or you could name your friends. Right. So it's not necessarily your biological children or anything? Correct. Yeah, you can decide who you leave it to. Contrary to what they do in France is there are lots of restrictions on who you can give things to. Okay, do you have children from a prior relationship? So if, if you have a second marriage and you need to plan for your, your new spouse and your prior children, that makes things complicated. And so a, a simple transfer on death deed may not cover all the scenarios that you need to cover. Does your spouse have children from a prior relationship? Same thing if you're wanting to reduce family conflict by making sure that some people don't make a claim against you while you're still alive and trying to pay your own bills. Maybe a transfer on death deed is too simple to cover that scenario. Are you worried that the assets that you accumulated might be used to enrich a replacement spouse. <laughs> so, so that's the guy that my wife would marry after I die. Well, I don't want him to have anything that I earned. And so I'm going to use a marital trust. 
this is too simple for me. And the reason that that might be important is maybe I don't care so much about the replacement guy, but if I leave everything to my wife and then she leaves everything to her new husband, then maybe our kids will be accidentally disinherited. Not because she even planned for it. She didn't know she was going to die before him. So the, this is a real life scenario. A guy in my church, he said when his mother died, left everything to his father, that was okay. He didn't need money. He didn't expect money or property. When his dad got remarried, he thought, that's fine. He's lonely. He needs a companion. And so he went to the wedding. Now, when his father died and left everything to his stepmom, he wasn't mad because he needed the money. He didn't. He still had his retirement. He saved his own money. But when she died and left everything to her kids, that made him mad because it wasn't hers. Well, it shouldn't have been hers in his mind. Some people worry about that kind of thing and some people don't. Okay, number six. This is a question that relates to that scenario where you have four beneficiaries of the property. Would they be good business partners? Because when you name all of them to share, they're going to have to make business type decisions about the property, even if they do want to sell it. Here are some things that people argue about. Do we fix it up or do we sell it as is? And who, who's going to be the realtor? One time I heard there was a statistic that every single person knows seven realtors. But then I was reading in the news that last year there was more realtors that joined the, uh, the profession than any other year. So it's just something that they argue about that does happen anytime you use a deed because they're just all named with equal authority. They all have to sign the sales contract. They all have to go to the closing. They all have to sign the deed. And so they all have to agree on the purchase price and on the concessions and everything. Now, if you just leave it in your will, well, then the executor can make all those decisions. Or if you have a trust, your trustee can make all those decisions. Are you planning for government benefits to pay for your long-term or assisted care or nursing home care? Now, we talked about scenarios where the ladybird deed and the transfer on deed worked. But generally, that's only for the homestead because you're allowed to have a home and still qualify for government benefits. But if you have rental houses or properties or vacation properties, doing these types of deeds isn't going to save you because the value still counts against you. You got too much money to qualify. So these are just some scenarios that are, are pointing to the fact that it, it may be too simple for your situation. You may use the transfer on death deed for your homestead and then we have to figure something else out for the, the other properties. Number eight, are your beneficiaries disabled, incapacitated, or receiving any means-tested government benefits themselves? I alluded to this fact when we talked about disclaiming or waiving the property or the rights to the property. Well, even if somebody's waiving that, disclaiming their interest, and they're already on government benefits, that still might cause them to be disqualified. So before you name beneficiaries to certain things, it's 
it's very good to know what their situation in life is like because you might by accident do something that causes them problems. Um, imagine a scenario where you have a disabled daughter and you want to leave her an inheritance because She's not going to be able to work a good job and earn a good income and have a retirement. She's able to take care of herself a little bit, mostly, but she's not going to be able to earn uh, all, of that, all of those assets after you're gone. So you want to leave her an inheritance, but you don't want to disqualify her from government benefits. There is a way that you can do that but not by using these methods. Because using these methods, she ends up with a check that she has to deposit into her bank account, and then all of a sudden, Social Security says you're disqualified, you got too much money. Medicaid says you're disqualified, you have too much money. Even if you disclaim that, they say you should have gotten it, you should have, and if you had, then you wouldn't have needed government benefits. But there's this other thing called a special or supplemental needs trust that the government allows. You leave it to your beneficiary in that kind of a trust, and the government says, oh, well, that's okay. You just There's a lot of restrictions on that kind of trust. That's why Social Security and Medicaid allow it. Would your beneficiaries use your financial legacy for positive purposes or negative purposes like unhealthy addictions to alcohol, drugs, gambling, pornography? My dad always told us, you, more money will make you more of what you already are. And so if you're an alcoholic and you receive an inheritance, you'll drink more. If you're a charitable person, you'll probably give more. And so I encourage my clients to think about that question. And most people tell me that their children, their beneficiaries, are complete angels. They never do anything wrong. <laughs> but see, I don't know them. So I have to go with what they're telling me. Um, and then number 10, do you have dreams, ideas, goals for leaving a lasting legacy? Things that you do want them to accomplish using the inheritance. We can create an incentive trust for that. You know, get your education. That's probably one that everybody's thought of. Okay, now's a good time for me to check your temperature. I would like, by show of hands, if you want to participate, how many of you would say that the transfer on death deed is right for you? Maybe. Okay. Okay. And so how many people would say after that top 10 list you're thinking twice? Okay. Okay. Okay, now is a good time for questions, and if you don't ask enough, enough questions, I have a case study that I'll go through. Any other questions? Yes, sir? I would like to, what I would like to do is transfer this home in her name. But when she kicks the bucket on her death, I would like to see that home come back to me. What do I have to do? Well, you could do a gift deed but there's a tax, a tax issue there. Um, what, what, what you need is some combination of these things. 
So I would say find an attorney. I mean, you're, you're going to use the concept of a life estate, but then it's going to come back to you instead of you reserving the right to live there for the rest of your life. It's a little bit more complicated, but you can use a deed for that. Sorry that that's not satisfying. You can do it. I would just recommend an attorney be involved. It's possible to do it that way, but she doesn't have to. So I, w I wouldn't set it up that way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one more poll. Can, oh, before I get to your questions, I want to ask some questions before I forget. How many of you listen to the radio? How many of you listen to AM radio? Well, TPR is FM. Okay. How many of you listen to FM radio? Okay. How many of you listen to a podcast on the internet or on your phone? Okay. Some of you. How many of you read the Express News? Okay. Just Sunday. Oh, just Sunday. Yeah. How about the Business Journal? How many of you watch TV with commercials? Really? How many of you watch TV but you're able to skip commercials with your technology? Okay. That's so interesting. I just, it's hard to know uh, where to put information these days. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there were a couple other questions. It's really a, she's asking about the Lady Bird deed and the title companies. It's really a burden on, on the beneficiaries because title companies could change. Uh, their policies could change. The reason why it doesn't really concern me is because the Lady Bird deed is not illegal. And so we can enforce the terms in court if we have to. I've never had to do that. Usually I just have to get through the escrow agent and um, there's somebody else, I can't remember what their position is, and then get to the lawyer because their, their, pol their policy and procedure manual just says, you know, everybody has to sign. And I say, no, that's not true. Then I have to get them to ask, you know, higher ups. So th there's lots of ways to, to accomplish your goal. If that's a concern, then maybe you should use a will instead. Other question in the back? Yes. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. In the um, my daughter and I bought a house together a few years ago. Both of our names were on the deed. Um, my will is set up. My husband is deceased, and so my my will is set up that uh, my assets will be distributed to me and my our three children. Okay. Now that we bought this house together. My concern is, I 
I'm, I'm thinking that this would be a good thing for me to have to make sure that she doesn't have any problems upon my death, upon my act of the house. Right. Yeah, because the way it is now, she would be share, she would have half, and then everybody else would have the other half. Yes, and what if I had to go into a nursing home for Medicaid or something? Is that going to affect? Am I? In other words, would she have to pay that money into you know for my half of the house if I, if I have to? I, I think she said that that would be considered homestead. Um, it sounds like your homestead. You're allowed to have a homestead yes. and still get qualified. So they're not going to force you to sell your house while you're still alive. Sometimes it gets challenging for the other owner or for the rest of the family to deal with the house because when you move into, when you, when you get nursing home Medicaid, the general rule is that you have to pay all of your income to the nursing home. That's the co-payment. And so if you have a mortgage, well, it, who's going to pay that? Well, the other owner or the rest of the family has to come up with it. That's, that's one of the challenges created by that scenario. But what you said could help out if ultimately you want the whole house to go to one person. That's that's what it sounds like. Yes, ma'am? Um, no, you were talking about method of information earlier. So, so this would be considered a newsletter or as information uh, Yes, I have done newsletters before. So how many of you re read the newsletters that you get by email? How many of you read the mail that you get from the post office? Okay. That, that's interesting. Yeah. So you gotta read. Right. That's my opinion. Right. Okay, any other questions? We we can cut out early. Do we have a number for you? Yes, it's on the pen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there any need when you have only one beneficiary to do a uh, transfer on this? Well, remember, one of the benefits was bypassing probate. That would be the only benefit, really. Protect, yeah. And there's not going to be a whole lot of money either. So. Yeah. It's okay. And I just have the house. It makes sense. Okay. And, and, and so that, that fits one of those top, th top four questions. See, with probate, there is a cost. And so if you don't really need administration of an estate for paying claims and bills and distributing assets to a lot of people, then maybe you want to bypass that whole okay. scenario. And you to, to record the uh, transfer on death deed is minor, isn't it? Right. Recording any deed is like $36 for the first page and $4 for each additional page. But what about the charge for uh, the transfer or death deed? What does that run? Well, it depends on who you go to. Oh. It, in our office, we, we might charge a flat fee or we might charge hourly. So it depends on all of those extenuating circumstances. So um, it's best whoever you choose to have an initial consultation, most attorneys will do that free of charge. Oh, okay. Yes, more questions in the back. I have a question. Uh, you just made a comment. Uh, we recently did a will 
my mother recently did a will, and the lawyer said, this is your original copy, keep that safe, because uh, it's not recorded. Can I record it? That's a good question. Can I record the will before death? And the answer is yes, but don't use that terminology. It doesn't get recorded in the real property records. You can take it to the probate clerk's office and you tell them you want it to be held for safekeeping. And they used to charge $5 for that. I don't, if it's gone up, it, it's probably not very much. Okay, also in the back. Um, I have heard that you can do a handwritten will, and I just have one beneficiary. Can I do that? There's a statute that says holographic wills are valid, um, but you just have to... You also has to have to fulfill all the other requirements for having a valid will. You have to use the right words. Okay, okay over here. Someone you told me it's a good idea to have date on death put on your savings account. Where? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good idea for some people. Whether it's a good idea for you depends on who you want it to go to and how that affects everybody else. So remember, if it bypasses your will, and, and so go back to this list of 10 questions, because I think the same list applies to pay on death. Whether the beneficiaries that you have have some of these other concerns or whether you have multiple marriages. I, th I think that now you ultimately might come back to this same conclusion that it's okay, but I just encourage you to analyze your situation. Now the real reason that I was asking about radio is because I'm on the radio. And if you don't already listen to me, I want you to tune in. It's on 9.30 a.m on Saturday mornings at 11 o'clock in the morning. And so in order to prepare for my seminar today, last week I talked about all these deeds. <laughs> so if you forget something, you can go to talklawradio.com and listen to my radio program on the, on the internet. Or if you use podcasts, you can go to the whatever podcast you use and, and search for me there. Yeah. It's 9.30 a.m. radio. Will you pass those down? Talk Law Radio. That's where I help you discover your legal issue blind spots by talking about the law on the radio. <laughs> law. Talk law radio. And if you don't listen, but you know somebody who does, you can tell them that you met a charming attorney. Yes. Well, it, it's cheaper to plan than it is for probate because these things don't cost thousands of dollars. These are just hundreds, but probate will be thousands. Mm -hmm. Is probate dependent on is the amount that you pay to probate a will dependent on the amount of the property you're it's a, it's a factor because what that points to is having to deal with either a little bit or a lot, or taxes or no taxes. So it's not, it, it's not directly the same, but those are just factors that have to be considered if you have lots of uh, debts to pay, if you have lots of uh, people to notify, if you have um, 
lots of banks to deal with, lots of properties to deal with. It, it's not really the, the dollar amount, it's, it's the work that has to go into it. Go ahead. I always recommend an attorney because it's it's like if you were able to go to the pharmacist and buy the medication that you wanted would that always end well no. <laughs> there's some some drugs cause side effects right and then some drugs they cause problems with other drugs and so think about your your financial situation and your family situation the same way. It, it's not the, the paper that's really the value, it's the conversation with the attorney and figuring out what's best. So what are your plans as well? Okay. <laughs> are those your business cards too? Yeah, I have cards too. Okay. I just didn't want to shamelessly promote myself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I missed some. You had a question? I was going to ask for your number. Oh, okay. Your business number. I do have a question. Thank you. Yes. I only have a death question. Yeah. I'm naming my brother. But I want to put another change my will to another one. I'd like him to sell the house so he can give half to that person. Well, you can do another one that names two people, but they're going to have to agree, and you can revoke it all together and then let your executor sell it, but that's that goes through the probate process. So you just have to weigh those things. two different courses. Okay, so you can avoid the probate by doing the deed, but the deed still gets recorded. So someone can still protest if they saw the deed. Is that correct? Well, they can still protest, but if you're still alive, that would just be a conversation with you. If it's after death, then, then maybe they're alleging that um, the person who signed it didn't know what they were signing. Okay. So then the, Thank you. The, Thank you. Because the other course is, um, you can, if you do a trust, you can put everything in your trust, correct? Yeah. And that does not go through the court system. Right. Okay. So that might just be and the, And the trust is not recorded either. Right, right. That's yeah. what I'm thinking. It was kind of like one person for a friend and one person for me. So. Yeah. Okay. And can I get an extra card? I'm going to sure. pass it on to her. Sure. Thank you. Oh, gee, oh, next. Yes. I was going to ask you something. Um, I'm going, uh, I'm, I'm redoing my will. Uh, I'm, but uh, what I'm doing, I, I'm going to give all I have to charity. To charity, mm -hmm. so I, I, have, I don't lay a will, you know, and I put somebody else, you know, I want to change all that. But I want to put, do I need to create a will or do I need to, to get into one of those things? I want to make it as simple as possible for my niece. So she's one well, of you could do it either way, so you I haven't. I have no debt, I have no debt. My house is paid for, you know, and I have. Uh, bank account and uh, 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 one, I mean, uh, stock account and mm -hmm. those kind of things, you know, and insurance. I want to give everything to to charity, you know, to the, the one who take care of my house for wounded warriors. Yeah. Well, th see, the transfer on death deed only works for one property. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you have more, I have only it... One, uh, I mean, you want a house, but you, but all the, all house. all of the other assets together, yeah, yeah, yeah. it would be good to coordinate that with your will. Yeah, only with the will. I don't need nothing else, right? Probably not. 
Yeah, okay, I got it. Thank, Thank you. you. That's what I wanted to okay. know. Maybe I need to get into something else. Yeah. yeah. No, no, nothing you said made me think that you needed both. Yeah. yeah. Probably yeah. not. Just redo the wheel and uh, put everything down and everything. And right. Put your name on everything, yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm doing, you know. I want to, you know, to build, when they build house, you know, <laughs> build the house for the wounded warriors. You know? Oh, okay. That's what I want to do. Great. The money. Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. Well, yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. Well, what was your well, question? Thank you, well, thank you. I have two children, and I'm planning to do 50 50 on everything. Mm -hmm. I don't have very many assets. I do own my home. So, I was, is it, and I've been told by Lady Bird that you should get for me. So, with that criteria. Well, either the Lady Bird deed or the transfer on death deed. Did you say Lady Bird requires probate? No. Do either of those require no. probate? Neither one of them? No. I would just say it requires those two beneficiaries to be able to come to an agreement. I think they will. <laughs> but I know things change when, yeah. the, when the happen happens. Yeah. You know. Now, I have met siblings that work together well. They have so. different ideas for the property, but um, I think they can come to an agreement. But, um, you know, I'm not getting any grandkids and all that. I'm yeah. Just yeah. And I tell them they can give what they want. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, so either the living, they're. Lady Bird deed or transfer on death deed. Is there an advantage of one over the other? Well, the title companies prefer the transfer on death deed because it's a creature of the statute. All the provisions are there, but you have that disadvantage of having to deal with the creditors. So some people have a problem with that and some people don't. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Either All right. Works, so I should be okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. How do I get on the mailing list for your letter, newsletter? Um, let me get your information here. I called your answering service, but they never did anything. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. Here you go. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay, well, mine's just kind of simple. If it's just me and my husband, we have no kids, what happens if we don't have uh, any kind of will or transfer on death? Deed? Who would the house go to? Well, it, it might go to your spouse, but he would have to prove that that he was the only spouse and they, they would have to prove that you had no kids. No, but so, if something happens to him and I say accident or something. Oh, then it goes back up the family tree. And it could go to your um, parents or siblings or nieces and nephews. Oh, yeah. So you should have a, a will that says where you want it to go. You could name a charity. Oh, okay. But uh, so it's for us, it's best to get a transfer on death fee, you know? No, I, I, I would say after both of you are gone, it doesn't really matter, you I, know, what the administrative expenses are. Oh, if I it's going to so. be a charity, then just let them deal with it. You uh, just need a will. So I just need a will, say, well, you know, leave it on. Say, if I need my brother to, to take over the house or something, or... Would your husband choose your brother as well? Yeah. Okay. We, we both don't have kids. Yeah. So what kind of... But he's probably do? your age or around there. Yeah, right. So you, that, that's the advantage with a will is that you can have more contingencies. Okay. If okay. not him, then his children oh, okay. or a different yeah, sibling. What kind of will? Because what kind of 
kind of will do I need? A living will or just a first will? Well, a living will is where you say you don't want life support. <laughs> oh, okay. You need a last will. Last will? Yeah. Okay. Okay, then I'll give you a call. To okay. Where we could set up or whatever. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Nice so to much. meet you. Same here. Thank you. Well, you need more than just a will. So, do you have a power of attorney? No, I don't have nothing. Oh, yeah. 